Hey YouTube family, it's Umberto from Great Law TV, and uh, today we're going to talk things all CISPA, the Child Status Protection Act. It's a very important piece of legislation that you need to know about. A lot of you YouTubers think you're not included in your parents' petition because you turned 21. Well, guess what? There's a fictitious age that you can calculate. We're going to give you the formula so you can calculate and perhaps you were included in your parents' petition. There's an age that's locked in under 21. We're going to get to it. It's kind of complicated, but what I do, as you know, I take a complicated subject. I make it very simple for you to understand. So that's what we're going to do today. Make sure you go to the frequently asked questions. We're getting a lot of feedback. Good stuff on that. You can find out the answers to a lot of your questions. Click on. It'll go to the video. Make sure you like and subscribe. Courtney and I only have a little bit of time to answer these comments. So unfortunately, we're giving preference to our subscribers. So please, you know, subscribe. We're up to to 3 million views and we're almost at 40,000 subscribers and want to get to 50. Help us do that. All righty. So let's get started on uh, CISPA. Hey, 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 hey. So what is the applicability of CISPA? What it is basically is it provides beneficiaries and derivatives who might be turning 21 and who would otherwise age out and not be included in, in derivative petitions, family petitions, etc. This allows you the opportunity to qualify. What types of petitions fall under CISPA? Immediate relative petition. That's unmarried sons and daughters, under 21 of U.S. citizens, family preference petitions one through four. We have employment-based petitions one through five. It also applies to VAWA, an I-360, where your kids may be included in that application, depending on the dates and filing and calculation. Also, diversity, again, children under 21 included. Also, you have derivative asylum and derivative refugee applications. Bigger picture, what are we talking about? These applications take time to adjudicate. While the applications are being adjudicated, kids are getting older, right? And they thought if the case is not approved or available before they turn 21, then they lose out. But that's not the case, all right? So that's what CISPA is all about. Petitions take a long time to adjudicate. And during that time, we're going to look how we calculate that and make sure that the individual principal, it could be a principal, we'll go through examples, uh, a, a principal beneficiary could be a derivative, that's children of the actual principal beneficiary, okay? So we'll go through that. So CISPA came into play on August of 2002, so it's applicable to cases after 2002. It applies equally to consular processing cases, as well as adjustment of status cases in the US. So you can use the formula that we're gonna provide in each of those cases. Immediate relative petitions, refugee petitions, and asylum petitions are a little different. You calculate the age on the date of filing generally, okay? So family-based petitions, employment-based petitions, diversity petitions, so you have to actually calculate the age now. Why? Because again, these petitions take time to be approved and derivatives are getting older, so you have to calculate the age. Now, there's an additional requirement for the family employment base and diversity petitions. Once the petition is approved and available, you must pursue the petition within one year. If you do not act, then you're not gonna get it even if you calculate your age as under 21. So how do we calculate the CISPA age? This is what we've been waiting for. It's a formula. It's the age of the beneficiary or derivatives at the time the visa is available minus the amount of time it took for the petition to be approved. So how do we determine visa availability? We talked a little bit about that earlier. We had previous videos on the visa bulletin. You gotta go and do a refresher because that's the real important part of this, okay? When does the visa become available? On the visa bulletin, remember you have final action dates, that's the when the priority date becomes current, and you have filing dates, okay? You have dates when you can file for petitions, either consular processing or adjustment of status. When do you determine the visa is available? Visa availability means 
the visa petition is approved and current on the final action date chart. CISPA goes by the final action date when you're calculating age. The visa has to be approved before you can calculate CISPA age, okay? Let's say you have the petition is approved, but under the visa bulletin, it's not available yet. So you can't calculate the age yet. You need both approval and both availability. Let's say um, the visa is current, the final action date is current, but the actual petition has not been approved. You have to wait for the approval of the petition and on that day, now you have both the approval and the availability, you calculate the, the age uh, of the beneficiary or the derivatives at that time. So you, you ask yourself, so which one do I take? Do I take the date on approval or the date when it becomes uh, available? The law says you take whichever one occurs the latest. Where the visa bulletin becomes current later, usually that's the case. The visa bulletin becomes current later, that's when you calculate the age, okay? All right, so how do you determine the length of time the petition is pending? Fairly simple. You look at the receipt date, right? And then you look at the date it's approved. That's the length of time it took the petition to be approved. I'm not going to spend much time on that, but that's fairly, fairly straightforward. All right, so I'm going to give you an example. In this first example, we have a daughter who's under 21 of a legal permanent resident, okay? That's the 2A category. Under normal circumstances, if she turns 21, she goes to the 2B category, which is a lot slower. You lose a lot of years if you're not under 21. The waiting period is much, much longer. So how do we calculate it uh, in this particular case? As you can see here, let's look at the visa. It took two years for this visa to be adjudicated, okay? So let's say it's available when she's 22 years old. So she's otherwise over 21, right? You take her age at that time, 22, minus the amount of time it took the petition to be approved, two years, she's 20 years old. She has a CISPA age of 20. Okay, let's take the second one. So this is a first preference petition, unmarried daughter of a US citizen. Now, in this case, as you can see on the visa petition uh, and the NVC petition, she had children, okay? So we're trying to calculate whether or not these children would be included in her petition at the time that visa was available. All right, so what we do, again, this petition took six years to adjudicate, all right? So this is a derivative case. So what we do is we take the age of the children at the time the visa is available and you subtract six years. So all of these kids were included. They were over 21 at the time it was available, but when you reduced it six years, they had a fictitious age of less than 21 years of age. Fantastic, they all got the visas, all right? so. Um, that's basically how it works. Uh, you have other types of cases like fourth preference brother and sister cases, again, where you're looking at derivatives. These petitions can take up to 10 years to be approved. So derivatives can deduce that time and get a fictitious age and perhaps be included in the petition. So you always want to do the calculation. You may qualify. What happens when there's retrogression? What does that mean? That means when one month the visa is current and then the next month it regresses and it's not current, okay? You have two different scenarios there. Now, if you have filed the adjustment of status when the case was current and it was available and it's pending and it regresses, the, the visa numbers regress, the age stays the same as calculated when you filed the adjustment of status. It will not change. Now, if you do not file an adjustment of status, and the visa number regresses, when it comes back and it's current, that's when you're gonna calculate the age. So the bottom line is you wanna file these petitions as soon as you can. Remember the additional requirement, you need to seek to pursue this visa within a year of it being approved, okay? That's so, so important. A lot of people miss out on the opportunity to get the green card because they don't pursue it. They, they're waiting around and a year goes by and it's too late at that point. So what can you do to make sure that you are included in the petition, you're pursuing your green card, okay? So what you do is you can do different things. Number one, you can file an adjustment of status within the year of availability and approval, okay? That's the first thing. Number two, you can file what's called the DS-260. That's if you're gonna consul process. 
You can also pay the visa fees online. That's going to uh, be sufficient for showing that you're seeking your visa. You can also pay for the I-864. That's the affidavit of support. That is okay. And then you also can do what's called an I-824 if it's an employment-based petition and you want to pursue your visa overseas, then you can file the I-824. We really appreciate you watching Gray Law TV. Click below, like, and subscribe. Make sure you subscribe so I can answer your comments. We're going to bring you some good news next week. You guys love the GN. And uh, if you want bad news, you got to go to the other channels. We only give you good news here.